you are here because you don't have much time for revision or you just want the five top quotes which are going to fit the five top themes. We're going to bash into it. At number one, we have a quotation about Macbeth's violence and addiction to bloodshed. So we find out that he doesn't shake hands with his victim Macdonald or wave goodbye to him, bid him farewell, until he unseamed him with his sword from the nave to the chops. But actually, he must have used a dagger. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do. He's got up close and personal. It shows us that he loves killing. There would have been a far easier way to do it without the joke of then saying to him, bye bye. It's a cruel humour. But he is admired for it at the beginning of the play. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that when the supernatural witches come along, they've chosen their victim really carefully. They know about his addiction to violence and they think they'll be able to manipulate that to get him to kill Duncan. It tells us that his ambition, once it's realized, will automatically lead to violence and destruction. And so the witches will be able to use that use Macbeth as an agent of chaos. It shows us his propensity towards violence and bloodlust right from the start, and it shows us the irony that society values this. He's praised for it until Duncan refuses to name him as his successor, instead choosing Malcolm. It's going to give us an interesting perspective on Lady Macbeth. She is attracted to this man as her husband, and she still thinks she can control that violence for her own purpose. And then it leads on to kingship. He has saved Duncan's reign from the Norwegian uh, invaders, and therefore, again, we celebrate this quality in him. It suggests that a king needs to be violent, but obviously that's also going to lead to disaster. At quote, Number two, we have Lady Macbeth attacking her patriarchal role in society to be a mother and a caring female. Instead, she says, come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. She needs to become a male in order to succeed in this society. More than that, she's going to need to become cruel. Her perspective of rulers, who are all men, is that cruelty defines them, and therefore violence defines them. It shows us that she wants to be more like her husband. We can easily link that to all these themes. As queen, she feels that a king has to be a violent ruler. It tells us about her manipulation of her husband and her desperation to get this title of queen herself. It shows us how she realises that her society is inherently violent and she has to become cruel in order to participate in it. It reveals her ambition, that her ambition is so great she'd rather reject her own status as a woman and her nature as a woman. And obviously Shakespeare is going to suggest that also drives her to madness because she is thrown off her own nature. And then it leads us, of course, to the supernatural. She is invoking the supernatural, these spirits, to help her become murderous. Obviously, Shakespeare is doing this to show that we must avoid evil at all cost. And trafficking with the witches, you already know the context of King James believing in witchcraft and Shakespeare flattering him by introducing the witches into the play. The advice she gives her husband is really crucial. She says, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. This, of course, is a biblical illusion. The serpent is the same one that tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to defy God's wishes. And that is exactly what Macbeth and his wife do. They define, they defy rather, the great chain of being. They defy the divine right of kings by murdering their way to the throne. So this portrays the couple as inherently evil. However, 
Shakespeare, by alluding to the serpent, is also suggesting that we are all capable of this evil. It is our original sin, because we're all descended from Adam and Eve. A further level of context here is that this is a picture on the, on the medal that King James had drawn up to celebrate his victory over the Catholic gunpowder plot of 1605, which had only just occurred. So this involved a flower with a serpent underneath it. And so this is another way to flatter King James by alluding to his own triumph. It also serves as a warning to the nobles that if they try to usurp the king by killing him, they too will be punished like the gunpowder plotters, but also by God. And therefore the reference to the serpent suggests they'll be aligning themselves to the devil, selling their souls, they will have eternal damnation. So, now we know that he's there to preserve the reign of King James. This reveals about Lady Macbeth that she is like Eve, a temptress, somebody who is in this respect, in Christian tradition, worse than her husband. It suggests that violence should remain hidden until it is needed, and that in fact is where Macbeth goes wrong. Remember, he kills the grooms after killing the king. If he hadn't killed the grooms, Macduff wouldn't have got suspicious, perhaps he would have got away with it. Then we have her ambition, and so we can definitely argue that part of his hamartia is that he also wants to use his wife to realise his ambition. That's why he wrote the letter to her, calling her my dearest partner in greatness, getting her help in killing the king. And obviously, we've got the supernatural reference again through the serpent. The serpent was just a serpent and the devil inhabited it in order to persuade Eve and Adam to go against God's wishes. And this suggests that perhaps the supernatural is inhabiting Lady Macbeth and Macbeth in order to get them to become evil. Now, once the murder has been committed, Shakespeare wants to show that you won't just be punished in heaven, you or rather in hell, you will be punished while you're still alive. And so this is how he's punished. Macbeth says, oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. So let's unpack it. Scorpions, of course, are animals. They are incredibly violent. They're killers. So it's fitting. But it suggests that Macbeth's own thoughts aren't just leading to more killings that he is going to perform. It also suggests that he is killing himself. His own identity has been ripped apart by his action in committing regicide. He's no longer the person he was, that man who was too full of the milk of human kindness. Instead, he's full of scorpions, he's losing his mind, is the implication, and that's going to be mirrored in the punishment that Lady Macbeth gets when she loses her mind and commits suicide. However, he is also still in love with her. He calls her dear wife, which reminds us of his earlier words, dearest partner in greatness. And at this moment in the play, he's not telling her about his plans to kill Banquo because he wants her to stay innocent. He realises what's happened to him is permanent damage, but he still wants to protect his wife from the damage that he's undergoing. Well, we can again see how the supernatural might be placing these scorpions in his mind, or you can argue that Shakespeare is saying, no, the supernatural ceases to have an influence once Macbeth has decided to kill the king, everything is his responsibility. That's important because when he's warning the nobles not to kill the king, it's not much of a warning if he says to them, you know, if you meet any witches, don't listen to them because they're not going to meet any witches. However, many of them are going to have the thought, hmm, I wonder if I could be king if I replaced Duncan by assassinating, not Duncan, uh, King James if I assassinated him. Lots of them might have that thought. So Shakespeare wants to show, look, yes, there was a supernatural influence, but actually the full responsibility belongs to Macbeth. He is accountable and therefore the nobles would also be accountable. They would also be driven mad by this murder of a king going against the great chain of being and going against the divine right of kings, before I forget. 
This also links back to the great chain of being. Man is superior to animals, but Macbeth has become a lowly creature like a scorpion. Yes, he's become king, but the irony is he is now no better than a scorpion. This is how God is going to treat him. So we can now see the consequences of his ambition. He could, of course, have just waited for the prophecy to come true. And it, according to the witches, who can only see into the future and see which grain will grow and which will not, he would have become king anyway. But it's his own ambition and the at best that forces him into this act to kill the king. He didn't need to do it. Again, that refers back to his violence. He's addicted to it. What does it tell us about Lady Macbeth? He's still in love. And what does it tell us about kingship? You won't be able to enjoy being king unless you are the rightful heir. And that again is a warning to any of the nobles thinking about asserting their right to the title of king. We come to number five. Life's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This is Macbeth's nihilism at the end of his wife's life. He now realises that he has not been in charge of his own life. He imagines that he's been acting out someone else's tale. Is it the witch's tale? linked to the supernatural, or is it God's tale? Has God dictated that this is the path he's going to follow? He's certainly going against God here, treating God as an idiot. This, of course, is blasphemous and com confirms that he will go to hell. But we already know that because he's killed the king. And it also suggests that he's lost his Christian faith, that there's no point in following God because he is an idiot. He's looking at his own life and seeing it as utterly pointless. The fricatives of fool and fury reinforce his disgust. Now, to the audience, of course, this is Macbeth directing his disgust at the wrong source. He's blaming God when he should be blaming himself. So the audience completely turn against him, and this too is part of his punishment. Not only does he not enjoy being a king, not only does his wife commit suicide, but he has no faith. And to an Elizabethan, or rather a Jacobean audience, this is losing the meaning of life. So they would have absolutely no sympathy for Macbeth. A modern audience, however, might feel more sympathetic to this nihilistic view. What does it tell us about the supernatural? Well. It's suggesting here that ultimately the supernatural doesn't have power. Although the witches are going to tell Macbeth that he doesn't have to fear uh, anyone except Macduff, but actually don't worry about Macduff because you won't be killed by anyone who's not born of a woman and that you won't be defeated in battle until uh, Dunsinane uh, Wood goes up the hill, you know, all that stuff. He doesn't believe any of that. He's already given up on life here. Yeah, it's not the supernatural that uh, is going to let him down. He's blaming God, but actually beneath that, he knows that he must blame himself. This is the consequence of his ambition. He's reached too high, and therefore God has punished him. It suggests the violence that is coming to him, but also the violence that he has perpetrated has made him realise that life has no meaning. So he's performed all these killings and he's telling himself that that was someone else's script, but actually it was his own script, his own choice to be violent. And perhaps he doesn't want to face his own bloodlust here as the cause of his demise. You can say that this shows his love for Lady Macbeth or his lack of love. So many people look at it and say, well, he's not really worried about his wife's death. He's just thinking about himself. Other people like me say, no, this nihilism, giving up on life, is because his wife has just died. That's what's given his life meaning. Now she's dead, he doesn't care anymore. And that's why he calls her the candle, a symbol of light, out, out, brief candle, which echoed her words, out, out, damned spot. Shakespeare giving them the same language and rhythm to show how suited they are to each other. 
obviously, the audience are going to say, yes, they're entirely matched as evil partners. She, the fiend-like queen, and he, the butcher. But, as a love story, it also works, even though we condemn them. What does it tell us about kingship? If you take the throne by power, you will be left with nothing. So, every theme, only five quotes, see you in the exam. I won't actually be there, but I hope you'll still have my voice giving you the grades.